I worked for the state of Illinois, um, and I filed a case, and we won. Any questions? <laughs> How'd you do it? Are you still working for the state of Illinois? No, I am not. No, I, I would like to start off with say, and saying thank you very much you know, for, to the John Locke Foundation and the Federal Society for inviting me here. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real honor you know, to speak before all of you and, and hopefully answer your questions uh, after Brian and I finish our remarks. Um, you know, because obviously North Carolina is, you know, is a right to work state and, you know, and really advocates for worker freedom and rights. And I think that's absolutely fantastic because that's why I got involved in this case. Um, because I'm a born and raised in Springfield, Illinois, our state capital. And as many of you know, um, you know, Illinois is a very, very heavy union state, uh, very much so in the public sector because, for example, AFSCME, uh, who is the union that I fought against, had membership of close to 35,000 state workers in the state of Illinois, which is a very, very large number. And obviously, with that kind of following, they have, you know, some very much, you know, major clout and, and the like. But, you know, the thing that, that I didn't like when I joined the state was the fact that Nobody asked me if I wanted to be a member of the union. <clears throat> nothing was ever said during the HR intake, and nothing was ever said about you know payroll deduction or anything like that. And what happened was, as uh, when I got my first paycheck, there was this line item that said union dues. And I don't know about you folks, but if nobody asks you whether you want a deduction on your paycheck, that kind of rubs kind of the wrong way. And um, so I asked around to my fellow coworkers. They said, oh yeah, everybody has to pay. If you want to work here, you have to pay this fee. And I'm thinking, why do I have to pay a fee to be a public servant and work for the state of Illinois? That just didn't, didn't seem right to me. Um, but as time went on, you know, I was more interested in doing a good job, learning the ropes, you know, and being a good employee. But again, you know, I kept seeing this money coming out of my paycheck you know, month after month. And then I started seeing some of the policies and the advocacy that the AFSCME union was doing. And then I also started seeing what SEIU and a lot of the others within the state were doing. And I just didn't, I, I just didn't like it, you know, because these were areas that they were promoting that I didn't agree with. And even though they claimed that with my agency fee that I was paying, which was approximately 80% of a full union membership, how do I really know where this money is going? And the big question is, you don't really know because there is no real transparency. Because even though I did receive, and I only received one, Hudson Agreement, which is what tells me as a non-member what my you know, fees are going to pay uh, and what they're going for, it was so nebulous that there's hard to understand where the money's going. For example, they had a line item called advertising. Well, every Wednesday, all the union people would show up at our office with green t-shirts on as a message of solidarity. So is that advertising? They also had lots of other things where they would do union meetings at lunch hours, um, you know, and they bring in sandwiches and that sort of thing. And it was a, I found that, is that advertising? Or if they advocate for a particular political candidate, is that advertising? Well, you really don't know because there is no transparency there. And that's one of the things that I, that I didn't like. And quite frankly, I felt very powerless because as a non-member, there was no way that I could challenge or no way I could you know, question any of this. Um, that's the part that, that I didn't like. So, again, as time went on, I kept seeing more and more of this, and I got more involved in, in the fact that I just hated it. And, uh, but I didn't know what to do. And that's when I found, uh, through a mutual friend, the Liberty Justice Center, um, and, you know, started a dialogue with them. And they believed in many of the same things that I did. You know, they are a um, public interest law firm. 
you know, they take cases of freedom and rights, and if necessary, they file litigation. Well, I had no idea that we were going to go this far in going into the federal court system and that we were going to be challenging the Abood prior decision from approximately 40, 41 years ago. And as time went on and as things developed, you know, I kind of became more and more in awe of, of what was happening. I mean, you know, let's face it, you know, going to the Supreme Court is a big deal. I mean, when you look at the number of cases that the court uh, accepts and hears in a year's time in a term, uh, the chances of us, you know, getting a hearing and, and going to the court is, is quite, um, well, it's just, it's daunting, quite frankly, you know. And the fact that when we started the case, there were three of us on the, you know, named in the court documents, but two other people got uh, dropped off. Um, one person dropped off due to a technicality in the law, you know, which I'll leave to Brian to explain because I'm, I'm not an attorney. And the uh, second person dropped off just because they started to see, you know, the pushback and they started to see the media and so on and, and just didn't want to continue. Um, but we had our hearing in February of uh, this month, a year ago, and, and it was quite awesome because you had all of these pro and con people out in front, and to sit in the Supreme Court building and see the justices file in, I'll be honest, is very, very intimidating, and when they call your name and your case, you know, that's even more intimidating. Um, and as a friend of mine said, it's a good thing they don't trial criminal cases there because I'd be in big trouble. So, um, we didn't get the decision right away uh, in June when we went back to the court. Um, we went into the court on Monday of, uh, at the end of June, and I was sitting with John Tillman, who's the CEO of Illinois Policy, and Governor Rauner, the governor of Illinois at the time, and we're waiting in the gallery, waiting for our case to be called. Well, it wasn't called. And so we left and came back the next day. And we check in at the bailiff's office. We get escorted into the chambers. And we expect to get the decision on Tuesday. Well, that didn't happen. So now we're kind of thinking, OK, Wednesday has got to be the day, because that, according to the court schedule, is the final day of that term although the court does have the ability to extend it if they wish. Well, Wednesday kind of felt a little bit like the Bill Murray movie, you know, Groundhog Day. You know, same thing happening each day. So we go into the bailiff's office to be escorted in, and the, the bailiff and one of the staff there says, oh, we know who you guys are. Come on in. That worried me. <laughs> because if they recognize you at the Supreme Court, you've been there too much, or this case has a lot more importance than what you think it does. Um, so we filed in, and uh, Justice Kennedy um, says, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't Kennedy, it was Roberts, said, uh, we'll now hear Janice versus AFSCME. And Justice Alito will read the decision. Well, right then and there, we knew that we had won because we knew Alito had written some things prior and he was obviously the, on the conservative side and, and, and the like. So we're kind of all fist bumping in the, in the gallery there, you know, and, and then trying to listen to what Justice Alito said was quite frankly, it kind of is a blur right now because I'm trying to listen to what he said, but at the same time excited, I'm nervous, and I'm thinking, oh my God, what did I just do in a way? And so, um, you know, we, we get out of the courtroom, and of course there's a media throng, and I've got uh, people that are pushing me here and pushing me there. You know, their Fox News wants an interview, uh, Pete Williams on NBC wants an interview, and so on and so forth. And, um, and then I'm hearing that, you know, I, I need to go on Shannon Bream's show that night at 11 o'clock, and then I've got all these other radio people that want to talk to me, you know, and so quite frankly, the whole day was kind of a blur. 
you know, I mean, you've got, you're being pushed and, and pulled and, and so on. Um, but it, it, quite frankly, now that it's kind of sunk in, it's, it's quite an honor and it's quite interesting, you know, to, you know, to be the face of this cause, which is one of the reasons I retired from the state of Illinois and I joined Liberty Justice Center. Um, and I've got to talk about that senior fellow thing. I don't think I'm a senior, but that's what they say. Um, but now I'm, I'm going around and I'm advocating for worker rights. Because what we saw was a pushback by the unions in not wanting to honor the decision. And it's amazing what we're seeing out there and the amount of misinformation that we're up against with the unions. Like unions are saying, public sector unions, they're saying that if you're not a member of the union, you're gonna lose your pension. Well, that's false because the pension comes from your employer. So how are you gonna lose your pension? Most of the time, uh, state pensions are codified and they're in statutes. Um, they also say that you're gonna lose your health benefits. Well, again, that's false because, again, the employer provides the health insurance. So how are you, how are you gonna lose it when it's part of the package? And they also say, well, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna lose your wages. Well, how's that gonna happen? Because I don't think there's very many state employees that are gonna work for free. And they're gonna have to pay some kind of a wage. So all of this misinformation is being put out there by the unions you know, to try to keep everybody together and to keep their monop monopolistic power that they have, which they've had for years. And now that that monopoly has kind of been curtailed a bit, they're fighting tooth and nail to keep people in the fold, whether they want to or not. And that's what we're up against, and that's what we're fighting, and that's what, what I'm doing, that's what Brian is doing, and that's why we're coming out to speak to people like you to let you know what really is going on out there because there is this dichotomy of difference from what the unions are saying and what we are saying. And by we, I mean liberty justice. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to just let people know that they have the right to make their own choice. We are not against collective bargaining. We are not against unionization. You know, if you want to become a member of the union, be my guest. Sign up voluntarily. But don't force people to pay dues and be a part of an organization you don't want to. That's, that's a constitutional right. And what a lot of people don't remember is that the Constitution is a contract with the people of this country. It's not a suggestion. Too many people out there think the Constitution is a suggestion. It's not, it's a contract, okay? I think we have to remember that and we have to fight for that and that's part of what I'm doing and the like. You know, so the one thing that we have to look at is some of the things that are going on in state legislators and across the country. For example, Hawaii adopted a statewide opt-out window that says only one week out of the year, if you don't want to become a member of the union, you can opt out. That's not right because that takes away, as the decision says, that you have to affirmatively declare. Let's look at Oregon, for example. Oregon introduced legislation that created a slush fund that says that they're going to pay the union directly these agency fees. That's taxpayer money it's gonna go direct to the unions. How can we do that? What they're gonna say is that if you're, a, if you're paid $50,000 as an employee, they're now gonna say on paper that your actual payment is now 49,000 and 1,000 of it's gonna to go to the union, bypassing the employee. We, we just can't allow that to happen. That's not right. It, it's, this is what we're fighting, among other things. Um, so even though all of this is going on, and you know, I'm frustrated like I think a lot of other people are, you know, I'm part of this movement and part of this idea of getting the word out 
that because of the Janus decision, boy, I hate saying that. <laughs> um, the, you as an individual have the right to choose for yourself. And don't we all have choices that we make on a daily basis from the time we get up till the time we go to bed? Why shouldn't public employees have that same right across the country? This case isn't about me. This case is about five and a half public, five and a half million public sector workers out there that now have a choice and a voice to make their own decision. And in order to help them do that, we're filing litigation all over the country, which is what Brian's going to speak about, because we're finding that without litigation, they're ignoring many of the precedents and you know what's in the case and what's going on. Um, so I think that you know the, the end game is going to take a while. It's going to take another two to three, maybe four years. Nothing in a fight of this nature is going to be automatic. It's just not going to happen. And um, it's going to take a while. And it's going to take all of us as individuals and as organizations like John Locke, Federal Society, for us to get that word out and work on it. And, you know, again, I just I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, and I appreciate you showing up and, you know, hearing my little speech. Um, and I think as John Locke stated, he said, the end of law is not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. And that's what we're doing. We're trying to enlarge and preserve the freedoms that we have. And if we don't fight for it, and if we don't work for it, it's going to go away. And we can't afford to, to let that happen. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, as Mark said, my name is Brian Kelsey. I'm a senior attorney with the Liberty Justice Center, and I do want to thank the John Locke Foundation for having me here, hosting me in one of my favorite states, North Carolina, where we're only one day away from the big game. And one of the reasons why I love North Carolina so much is because the big game does not refer to the Super Bowl, but just to whatever the next ACC basketball game is. <laughs> and so tomorrow night, I'm just curious how many people are going to be wearing Wolfpack Red with Professor Taylor, all right? A few of you. And how many of you are going to be wearing Tar Heel Blue tomorrow night? Anyone? A few of you. Okay. Well, this is, uh, I am a graduate of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and so I love getting back here. And now that I've alienated half the room, um, I do want to see, see how many of you are also here with the Federalist Society today. Okay, so several of you are involved in the Federalist Society as well. And uh, I don't just wear the tie uh, just for fun, but I actually am a true believer in the Federalist Society and I've seen all the great work that this uh, organization has done for our country. Uh, like you, Mr. President, uh, I sat in your seat many years ago as president of the, the law school chapter of the Federalist Society at, at Georgetown. So I appreciate your involvement in this group as well. And it's exciting to me to keep up with North Carolina uh, and to see exactly all of the uh, positive effects that the John Locke Foundation has had in moving the conservative movement uh, forward in a prominent way in this state. And that has been uh, really transforming in, in many ways here. So it's an honor to get to be with you and to be a part of that and to speak here. Uh, it's always an honor to speak with Mark Janis, uh, who is an individual who has a tremendous amount of courage uh, to stand up uh, not only for his own personal rights, but also for the rights of over five million workers. So let's give him another round of applause. Mark Janis is, is truly a hero, uh, truly a hero for workers. And uh, you may be saying, uh, we're here in North Carolina, we're a right to work state. Can you explain to us what all is happening in Mark Janus's case and how does this apply? Because it does not apply, it did not apply directly to North Carolina. It applied to 22 states throughout the country uh, that had forced government workers to pay money to government unions even when they didn't want to. Uh, you can probably guess where those 22 states are located. Uh, I, bet if I, I bet if I took names, I could probably get every one of them here from this group in about 25 guesses. But more or less, they're states in the northeast, the northern part of the Midwest, and then the left coast. 
And uh, in those states, uh, they were saying that if you wanted to be a member of the union, and that was your right, and you could do that, and you would pay union dues. Uh, oftentimes, these are, uh, as you know from your fights in the legislature last year, these are dues that are deducted directly from people's <coughs> paychecks. Okay, so that's one option. Your other option is you could choose not to be a member of the union, but in these 22 states, they still said to people like Mark Janis, you still have to pay us pay fees to the union. These were fees that, that were called agency fees. They like to call them fair share fees uh, to make them sound fairer. Uh, and they were sometimes 80%, 90%, in some cases even 100% of the regular union dues. <laughs> Uh, and of course, you got none of the benefits of union membership in those instances. Uh, but they were still required, these workers were required in these 22 states to pay this money to, let's face it, uh, to some of the most overtly political organizations <coughs> in our entire country. These are organizations that are espousing views that people like Mark very much disagree with. And, uh, you know, he certainly. Uh, did not want to associate with these groups and certainly did not want to have to be forced to have his money taken from him and paid to causes with which he disagreed. And amazingly, the U.S. Supreme Court had 40 years earlier said that that was perfectly legal and perfectly fine to do in that Abood case that he referenced. Uh, but thankfully, uh, our current Supreme Court last year saw to it to overturn 40 years worth of precedent and to say that no, the free speech clause uh, actually does uh, mean something in this context, and, it, and, and that people like Mark Janis have the freedom of association uh, to associate with whoever they want to associate with, and also to not associate with groups that they don't want to support with their monies. And then also, uh, they have the, the freedom of speech to be able to espouse the views that they believe in, and they cannot be forced to give money to groups that espouse beliefs that they may not agree with. So uh, again, you may be asking yourself, well, in North Carolina, how do these issues apply to us? This is a right to work state and has been for many, many years. Uh, but you will recall uh, that just, uh, just last year, you had a strike here. Which group went on strike here? It's teachers, you had a teacher strike here. And you had uh, many individuals who, uh, who were protesting outwardly on that uh, for those causes and those issues. Again, some teachers agreed with those positions and other teachers disagreed. I'm willing to bet, I don't know, I wasn't here, I didn't see it, but I'm willing to bet that you also had uh, union members who came into your state of North Carolina from outside of the state and who joined in those protests. And they joined in those efforts. And so Mark, uh, Mark Janice's case affects those people in many ways. Because again, we're talking about 5 million workers in 22 states across the country. This is billions of dollars at stake through these agency fees, as they were called. And I don't know for sure, but I'm willing to bet that that, that, that money, some of that, that's billions of dollars, that some of that money was used to organize efforts in other states, just like North Carolina, to organize individuals, uh, to, to pay for and to send individuals into your state who did not directly have a stake in the conversations that were taking place here in North Carolina. And yet they were coming in and they were using those agency fees that had been collected in other states to come in here and to enter into your conversations here. So that's how it does affect, in, in many ways, all 50 states. Another way uh, it affects others is that is with another series of cases that we have filed in, um, in other states. I want to tell you about another teacher's strike that recently occurred. And this occurred just a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact. And it was in California. This is in Los Angeles. It's the second largest school district in the entire nation. And so when they had a teacher strike, you can imagine this shut down virtually everything. Um, you're talking about thousands of teachers uh, who chose not to come to work. But I want to mention to you one teacher who did choose to come to work throughout that time period. His name is Tommy Few. And uh, Mark and I had the pleasure of meeting with Tommy Few back in November. 
Uh, he is a, one of our clients here at the Liberty Justice Center, and Tommy Few is a really special man. He, it, my, my wife was a teacher. My mom was a teacher for 30 years. I believe that there is a special place in heaven for those who are willing to teach our students. I think it is an honorable profession, and I think it is, is vitally necessary for ensuring that our next generation has the skills that they need to not only be successful in the workplace, but also uh, to be successful uh, human beings and in life. And there's a really special place <coughs> in heaven for special ed teachers. Now that is a hard job, and it is an often thankless job uh, because you have well-meaning, well-intentioned parents who love their, their children, uh, but they are asking for above and beyond what most parents are asking for. And so Tommy Few is actually one of those special ed teachers. He, he is someone who truly believes in his students, again, willing to teach them uh, even on days when thousands of other teachers were not going to work uh, because of a strike. He was still willing to be there every day because he believes in his students and he believes they have a right, uh, they have a right to learn. So, so he uh, had heard rumblings of Mark Janis's case, and so he went to the union and he said, hey, I hear that I might not have to pay you dues. Can you please let me out? <laughs> the first one probably did have a please thrown in there. <laughs> I'm not so sure about the second one, but he was denied a second time. And in fact, the third time, he took it upon himself to hand deliver his letter of union resignation to the president of the union. Once again, it was rejected and it was denied because California is one of the states uh, that allows for uh, and what they call an opt-out window. And they said, okay, well, you can, you, you can get out of the union if you want to now. I guess there's some sort of Supreme Court decision, but you have to do it on the third Friday of the month between 3.30 p.m. and 4 o'clock p.m. and you have to hand deliver it down to this office across town. I'm exaggerating for effect on the details of it, but the point is many unions put in place these opt-out windows which only last for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks during the entire year. And if you miss that window, then you've got to wait a whole nother year. In fact, we have filed cases in some states where you have to wait three years to be let out of your union if you want to stop being forced to pay money to an organization with whom the politics you disagree. So Tommy Few's case has been, has been filed and it's pending in federal court in California right now. And as I say, it is a true honor to get to represent Mr. Few. Um, he, we're, we're arguing really three issues. Uh, number one, that these opt-out uh, time windows, that those are unconstitutional. They're a violation of, of Tommy's free speech rights. Uh, number two, we're saying that he is owed his back dues, uh, certainly from at least until he first asked to be removed from the union. And in fact, back to uh, before when he was forced to, to join the union, which was two years ago in his case, because he was ultimately given an unconstitutional choice at the time. He was given the right to either join the union and pay a whole bunch of money to the union or not join the union and pay a whole bunch of money to the union, <laughs> which was an unconstitutional choice. That's a, a, a false dichotomy there. And he should have been given the option, we know now, as a result of Mark Janice's case, to either join and pay money or not join and pay nothing at all. So we're asking for the back dues as well. And then finally, we're asking for a third thing, uh, that the union not be allowed to uh, negotiate on his behalf as his exclusive representative. Uh, we're, we think that he has a free speech right to speak for himself with his employer as to what his, uh, what his benefits, what his salary uh, should be. And these are the issues uh, that are involved. Uh, I will tell you that what uh, the union uh, attorneys have done in response in many instances, and in this case in particular, is they have uh, said, well, uh, we know that we rejected your claims three different times but now that you've gotten the Liberty Justice Center involved and you filed a lawsuit, now all of a sudden we're going to pay you, uh, we're going to pay you your money and we're going to try to pay you off and we're going to try to make this go away because we don't want a court to decide this issue. Uh, but we are determined with the Liberty Justice Center to bring this decision before a judge. Uh, we want a ruling. Uh, Tommy Few deserves a ruling and we are going to fight this case uh, through the district court. Uh, we, are, we will fight it through the circuit courts and if, it, uh, and if the Supreme Court sees to it that they have to revisit this issue again on its next phase, then we will fight it all the way to the Supreme Court again. 
There's another case that we filed in Illinois uh, for a gentleman named Eric Mandel. He's a diesel mechanic in his suburban school district. And once again, the union in a totally different state uh, has decided that they are going to try to pay off the plaintiff, even though they've denied his claims beforehand. They're trying this as well. In other states, we have a case in Hawaii uh, where uh, we represent a client. Her name is Pat Grossman. She is an admissions offer, officer in higher education in one of the campuses of the University of Hawaii system. And there, uh, she, they once again uh, decided to all of a sudden uh, send some of, her, some of the back dues to her that we were claiming on her behalf. And once again, we have found a, a, a plaintiff who I think is similar to Mark in the sense that, uh, and Mark, tell me if I'm wrong. She's rather, she was rather reluctant to get into this process in the first place, and uh, she believes that she has a right not to pay any money to the union, but she's not, she's not looking to be on national television. That's not her goal. She just wants to stop having to pay union dues. It's very simple. She just... She fundamentally disagrees with the politics of the union, and she thinks she shouldn't have to pay for that. So, uh, so that's her that's her position. And uh, is that the way you felt at the beginning, Mark, or not? Exactly. I'm not sure. Very much so. Yeah. And as you get involved in these cases, I think that that you get more and more uh, ensconced in 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 the uh, strength of your views. I mean, what do you think about that, Mark? Oh, very much so. Because the thing you have to remember is that once you get involved in cases like this. Um, it's, you know, you, you, you learn more and more about it as you go through the litigation and you start reading, you know, the, the media reports and, and other reports. And it just becomes, uh, you know, you kind of, it, it, it makes you mad, quite frankly. That, you know, you get, you, get, you get a bit incensed because of the misinformation and the, the fact that not one single rebuttal to the case is based on, First Amendment rights of the Constitution, your freedom of association, freedom of speech. They'll, they'll talk about everything else but. <laughs> right. So this is the issue then with, uh, with Pat Grossman. And uh, like all of our plaintiffs, she is a government worker. She doesn't have a huge salary. You can Google it and find her salary on the internet. Uh, so these are real dollars that really make a difference in, in her life. Um, 100 bucks a month is something that's, that, that's uh, significant in, in terms of her salary. And yet she feels now so, uh, so strongly about these issues uh, that, she, that she sent the money back and said, thanks but no thanks. We want a court to make a decision on this issue and to determine that, in fact, I, in her case, have a constitutional right not to pay these fees. So good for Pat Grossman. I mean, it is, it is, it is just vital to have uh, courageous plaintiffs like Pat, like Tommy Few, uh, like Mark Janis. And the last one that I want to mention to you is a man named Brett Hendrickson. He is in New Mexico. He works uh, in quality control for the New Mexico Human Services. So he ensures that uh, case managers administer their food stamps correctly. Um, I'm not sure what he was doing during the food stamp shutdown over the last few weeks. He may have had a few days to, to slow down his work. But uh, there, the union said the same thing that they've told many of the other plaintiffs. Okay, we're going to go ahead and give you your money back, and we'll tell the state of New Mexico to stop taking these dues out of your, out of your paycheck. But they forgot to tell the state of New Mexico <laughs> to stop taking the dues out of his paycheck. So then the state came back and said, no, you've missed your window of opportunity. You have to wait a whole other year again. So th these are just these are terrible instances that are taking place to real individuals um, who have a real stake in seeing that their First Amendment free speech rights are protected. And we in the at the Liberty Justice Center are are uh, committed to fighting for those rights and even to the new frontier as well. That next frontier of cases that we plan to file, in addition to several other states beyond the ones I mentioned to you, uh, are uh, cases involved with workers who have been signed up after. Uh, Mark Janus's decision. As we like, as as Mark always says, all the lawyers in America now call these cases post Janus cases. And as Mark likes to remind us, he's still alive. <laughs> 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 so this is just the next frontier of Janus cases. Because for those new workers, they do need to be given that 
constitutional choice between uh, paying dues or not joining the union whatsoever. And unfortunately, in many states, we are seeing that state legislatures are passing laws that are forcing people and coercing people to continue to join the union even when they choose not to. So we're committed to upholding these rights, and we also are committed to answering, to the best of our ability, any questions that you have for Mark Janis and myself. Thank you so much for having me. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay, time for questions. Who would like to have the first question? All right, I'm already seeing hands and I'm right here, so let's start with you. Oh. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that first case that was 40 years ago and sort of the reasonings behind why they said that it was permissible for the unions to take those dues? I'm because it seems like logical to me that that is compelled speech now, but yeah. I'm, I'm gonna defer that to Brian, he's the attorney. <laughs> yeah. I and I mean, unfortunately, I, I agree with you. It's really hard to justify why that took place. That was called the Abood case. It was 41 years ago. And um, I think I, part of it was a, a true ignorance as to how, how it was going to play out. In fact, that was one of the issues that Justice Alito, Alito picked up on in Mark's case, is he said that, in fact, this standard that the court set forth has not been workable. And so Mark mentioned that he had a right, even prior to his um, to his decision to have listed out exactly how his union dues uh, were being spent and what they were being paid for, because the court then tried to tried to to uh, you know run down the middle of two competing interests, and they tried to say, okay, well you can pay for what was more or less the organizational structure of the union, but you couldn't pay for you could not be compelled to pay for the political part of what the union was doing. And they were saying that's not all that unions are doing, and therefore you could be, once again, compelled to pay for uh, the types of work that was going on your behalf to, um, to support you know, your, um, your you know, things like your compensation. And so that, that was the middle road that the court was trying to find there. But again, Justice Alito pointed out that, in fact, th this is an unworkable situation. You, cannot, you, you just can't tell what money is being spent where. And so you would see line items that, that the court even cited in its decision in which uh, it, would, it would say, well, you already brought one yeah. up. It would just say advertising. You I mean, feel free. Right. You, you know more about this. Well, yeah, and, th and that's a problem because there is very, very little transparency in union books. I mean, even as a union member, uh, you can't go in and look at the union books and really figure out where this money is going. And there have been some <coughs> legislative laws introduced to try to force some transparency on that in various states, but they've been shot down right and left. And I won't go into who's backing the shooting down, but it's, you know, it's where most of the money goes to certain individuals that are elected by, you know, the unions, because that's where a majority of the money goes. Um, something else that, that a lot of people don't realize uh, is that Close to 90% of union public sector union membership today never voted for that union to be their representative. I read a story a week or two ago about uh, an individual that they had to go back to 1975 to find somebody that actually voted in favor of that collective bargaining to be that exclusive representative. So what does that say when you've got 90% of the people now working in public sector that never even voted for the union, but yet here they're still moving on and they're still doing what they're doing? I have a question. In, in terms of the <clears throat> collaboration, so to speak, you just referenced where the states are trying to pass laws to fudge around the Janus decision. Have you had instances where there's any type of re retaliation or intimidation for people that want to come forward or movements in that direction when you, when you take on cases like this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you could, re you know, there are instances of, of well, I don't know if I should mention this, uh, Rebecca Friedrichs, who had the case before me, she wrote a book, and she's got cited teachers and, that she knows and that I've met that were intimidated by the teachers union whenever they spoke up and wanted that transparency and they wanted to fight for their students and they were shot down. 
In the state of California, public sector unions collect a billion dollars a year in dues. Now explain to me why they need a billion dollars a year just for wage and benefit negotiations. And where does all that money go? Nobody really knows yeah. because there is no transparency. Yeah. So absolutely, I mean, you can imagine the intimidation uh, that was placed against uh, our client Tommy Few in Los Angeles when he's one of just a handful of teachers who actually was showing up to work. And I mean, that's a, that is tough to walk through that picket line, but um, it happens. Yeah. But that's one of the well, yeah, benefits and, of having and, and see, I, Mark I on staff filed my to talk. case and yeah, got it going. I didn't even tell my mother <laughs> that I was filing this case. You know, because I wasn't sure what was going to happen and so on. But when I finally got to the court and they accepted to hear it and we got a court date, I told her. You know, I said, Mom, this is what I'm doing and I just want to let you know. And she said, oh, Mark, you know what they did to Jimmy Hoffa? <laughs> <laughs> True story. I mean, it... uh, my, my question is uh, uh, tangential to unions. But, and I'll give a better example than the union example. My question has to do with if public uh, legislators who are, are, vo are voted into office take an oath, and that oath says they will defend the U.S. Constitution, are they liable if they don't for removal? And this is being looked at seriously in a state which is having decriminalization of uh, marijuana and, and the point is, of course, it's a, the federal, uh, the feds say it's what a, a level one drug or something, whatever the nomenclature is. But it's illegal to make it legal. So the idea is, in this very blue state, to go after the legislators. I I don't know uh, the particulars of that of that state, but I can say in general that uh, most states do have. Uh, civil uh, immunity in place for state legislators who are speaking in their role as state legislators in that sense. So usually there is a doctrine in the court system of every state that uh, as long as there's a public debate taking place and you have a lawmaker or even down to a, a city councilman who's taking place in that public debate that whatever arguments they make or do not make in that particular role that they cannot be held liable for that. Now, how that extends to removal, again, I don't know. That would depend on the, particular, uh, the particulars of that state, but obviously it's ultimately up to voters to make those decisions uh, yeah. on their own. What if what? the discussion moves from discussion to a vote and they vote it in? Mm -hmm. Is that, does that make sense? Votes are usually covered by that very limited uh, immunity as well and mo under most state laws. But, but again, I, I'm just speaking generally. I can't speak to the particulars of that. Well, that case. It, and for example, in, in the state of Hawaii, when they pass that opt-out window, the <coughs> attorney general in the state of Hawaii said, well, yeah, we're pretty sure this is unconstitutional, but we're just going to have to wait and see if somebody challenges it. <laughs> and we are. And we are challenging it. <laughs> but I mean, great. but when you have a, a state elected official that makes that kind of remark, right. you know, what does that tell you? But, uh, and I will say one last thing. Uh, point two before we take our next question is that um, state legislators are now bound by that oath to the Constitution to uphold the Mark Janus decision. And so uh, what hopefully you should see in states uh, uh, like North Carolina, where you might, where it probably received a more favorable response from the legislature than in others, is hopefully you will see that state legislators will be looking uh, to take up those issues and to codify those rights uh, that Mark's case has made sure uh, are available to all of us, to make sure that you know, it's not, it's not just something that sits on the law books somewhere uh, from a Supreme Court decision, but it's something that actually makes its way into the law books of, a, of states like North Carolina. And, and there are some states that are starting to do that, and they're looking into it, but it's an uphill climb. With Justice Alito, Alito talking about the, um, the problem of allocation, is that going to throw open sort of the licensing problems that, like, um, I'm inactive with the uh, California bar. And we have a unitary bar. And over the years, I've had to pay this inactive fee. And they would take out. There was an allocation to this political <coughs> fees. And this year uh, was the biggest chunk. It went from $150 to 108 So they took out $42 for this politicking. 
But it seems like with Alito saying that allocation is, doesn't work, is that going to throw open those cases too? I would agree with you. I think the, the reasoning there would lead to that conclusion. But um, if, I, if memory serves me, I think that exact issue has actually reached the Supreme Court just a couple of years ago. And I think the court directly ruled that, no, you can still be forced uh, to pay that money. And so you know, we'll see whether that remains one particular exclusive carve out from the movement of the rest of the body of law, which is saying free speech rights really mean what, what they say and they're going to be respected or uh, or whether the you know uh, whether the courts do just stick with that one decision and say well we're going to stick with precedent here for a while and we're not going to reopen that issue I certainly hope they will all right since I'm here I'm going to go to this gentleman and then sir I'll come right over to okay you. we have a person over here too okay. do you have any figures yet on what the loss of union membership has been if any since this decision that, that is still open to interpretation. And I say that because the unions are certainly not going to put out numbers and make them look bad that they're losing membership. Now, in the state of Illinois, on the day of the decision, they lost all of the money that the fair share or the agency fee payers were paying, and that happened just like that. But under state of Illinois law, they are still representing everybody, whether they're union or non-union. And it was kind of interesting because they're now claiming that, oh, we have to represent all these people and we're not getting anything for it. But Illinois policy, uh, who I also work for, put forth legislation a couple of years ago, reintroduced it last year, that said, you know, if you don't want to represent non-members, then drop them off and, you know, only represent the people that you, you know, get dues from and that you represent. And the union fought that legislation. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. And here's the other thing. In the state of Illinois, the, they advocated and they got legislation passed that said that they have to represent everybody. The union wanted that legislation and they, they put it in as a statute. So, you know, they've kind of made their own little world or their own bed. And now that we have this decision, now all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh. Well, they asked for it, they got it, now they have to live with it. Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a, a question to the a little broader issue. Um, there's an unholy relationship between public sector unions and the public sector, and they collect money, and they, uh, the public sector unions give money to the politicians, and this relationship is, is corrupt. Um, do you see future um, litigation to, to, end, to end the existence of public sector unions or to prevent them from making political contributions to the people they're supposed to be negotiating against? I. I think one of the things, I'm not sure that you're ever going to really be able to separate that um, because from the standpoint that you've got private sector <coughs> individuals. But they're not getting that, political contributions to the leaders of the private sector. The relationship between private sector unions and the people they're negotiating with is adversarial. Right, right. In the public sector units, it's cooperation. It's a cooperate, right. Right. But so, so, I, but, Why you know, do you need a union in a cooperative relationship? Well, I think, I think the first step, well, true, but I think the first step you're going to look at is the fact that, you know, now that we have this decision and they're losing the fair share fees is going to reduce the amount they can contribute. Um, and then I think as people learn about their rights and they choose if they're on their own accord whether to leave, they'll lose some of that dollar. So I think you're going to see their influence begin to decrease. And I think that's where it's really going to go more than actual legislation because, and the reason I don't think you're going to see much legislation is because currently they've, you know, they've got too many people in their pocket already and that are just going to vote against it. Maybe in five years, maybe 10, I don't well, know. Well, it's my understanding when unions originally came into being, the public sector was excluded. And that public sector was added to the Wagner Act and uh, there was some act that allowed for the 
creation of public sector unions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now it corrupts uh, our uh, state, local, and federal political systems. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's any, any legal action that can mm -hmm. be taken to say, hey, look at this corrupt uh, relationship. Uh, well, as you mentioned, most of these decisions were made uh, politically uh, from elected bodies, and so it's it's ultimately going to be left up to them. I mean, there where where we, uh, at least from the liberty justice standpoint, I can say where we come in and where we uh, stand to challenge these laws is really based on the rights of the individuals. Yeah. We're looking at individuals and their free speech rights. Uh, we're we're not. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a, a goal of upending an entire system. We have a goal of representing individual plaintiffs like Mark Janis who are being treated unfairly and whose rights are being violated. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have a question about how you see this case interacting with another public sector free speech case, the Garcetti case from 2006, I believe. So in Garcetti, um, Supreme Court held that public employees have, uh, they can be fired for speech, not political speech, but employment related speech. So for example, if, if an employee wants to negotiate his own wages and benefits and tries to, um, the Garcetti opinion suggests that he can be fired for that. Uh, so I'm just curious how you're going to um, when you're litigating that issue, how do you see the Garcetti holding fitting into to that particular negotiation? That, that's an excellent question, um, and it's one that um, we have not gotten down the road of, of exploring yet in our briefing. Uh, but um, our, you know, our position is that it's ultimately uh, that right to free expression is ultimately um, is what we're after to protect, and so we think that that's not going to be a violation of constitutional rights to actually engage in in bargaining negotiations. But but you're right; that's an excellent <coughs> question. Have to argue to overturn Garcetti. In in a, in in a narrow aspect. We have time for this gentleman's question, and then we'll take two more, and then we'll call it done. Did the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation partner with the Liberty Justice System uh, Center in this uh, Janus litigation? Yes, yes, wanted. they did. Yeah. yeah, because they had previously argued uh, successfully, Bill Messenger, who argued my case, uh, successfully argued the Harris v. Quinn case. There was also an Illinois case that overturned the ability of SEIU uh, to collect dues from basically home health care, home providers, you know, which was kind of the starting to chip away at this, you know, these rights. And I've met Pam Harris, talked with her several times, and just a delightful lady. Uh, Brian. It's on. Good. Uh, Brian Rodney Pitts. Um, I want to bring this back to North Carolina. And I know you're not an expert on North Carolina and what's happened here, but uh, we had the Teachers Association protest here in Raleigh. Um, the association is not a union. Teachers are not allowed to unionize in North Carolina. Um, and yet they missed school that day, and we had all these union people who came from elsewhere and I presume that's because they want to unionize the school teachers in North Carolina. So the question is, A, did they not get paid for those days? B, what are we going to do to stop this from happening in the future? Um, what do you say? That's, uh, that's, that's a good question, too, and I don't know the specifics of whether they got paid. My guess is because this is a right-to-work state and because it is an association and not a union. My guess is perhaps they took um, sick day leave, that sort of thing, that, right. on the short-term basis. Does that sound right yes, from people who have well, knowledge of it? Okay, I guessed right on that. <laughs> vacation days, it's not like... Yeah. Right. right, as long as it's a short-term 
stoppage of work, then that, then that usually fills the gap. It's, it's only in much, much longer ones where you get into tougher questions. But yes, sorry. I know that various, uh, in, in several counties where many teachers were planning to do this, they actually cooperated with the school authority for an organized you know, day when everyone knew in advance that school would be closed because all the teachers or most, and, and then as, as far as your question about, um, you know, how do we avoid these types of situations in the future? I mean, there, uh, who knows? There are many ways uh, to do it. Uh, the, for the people who didn't go to work that day, of course, they would say, you know, throw more money into the system. Um, there, uh, as you know, too, the, the state legislature here already had a, a, big, a big discussion about um, the payroll deductions, right. and that, and they ultimately decided to end payroll deductions for teachers here in the state. And the judge ultimately decided that that, that was not allowed. Uh, I think that um, many of those cases like that that are pursued in state courts. Again, I'm speaking generally, not sure. necessarily of North Carolina, but I think that many of those uh, can have better success if they're brought in the federal court system. I mean, uh, right. Mark. Mark, Mark is obviously from Illinois. He was uh, arguing over a practice taking place in Illinois, but we chose to pursue his case in the federal court system, uh, which did not uh, bode well for us at the district court level or the circuit court level, but, but because we got the US Supreme Court to take it up, it did bode well for us. And so that's another avenue for places that have, uh, for states that have court systems where uh, perhaps uh, conservative causes don't bode very well. You could take bring these cases in federal court uh, if they, if they bring First Amendment issues, that's obviously a, a federal constitutional issue. Um, and then, um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, those are those are some of the issues um, that are involved in it, really. Well, one, Thank you. One of one of the things that I think a lot of people don't maybe understand or or they don't think about is that public sector employees, as union members, are also taxpayers because they pay taxpayer. They pay taxes like everybody else does. But it's surprising, at least in Illinois, the number of letters to the editor that, you know, say, well, geez, gee, if they're asking for a raise, you know, go ahead and give it to them because they don't pay taxes anyway. It doesn't affect them. We actually have letters to the editor that say that in Illinois. So it's very obvious that the general public doesn't understand the concept that state employees do pay taxes. And therefore, if you want to extrapolate, why doesn't the union leadership understand that? Because whatever they negotiate as a higher wage or benefit is ultimately going to cause a potential tax increase. You've got to pay for it somehow. And so therefore, what does that do? That burdens the membership. For example, California, the most recent strike that, that Brian talked about, they want to strike for six days. Teachers did not get paid for those six days at all. They get a 6% increase in salary, which was offered by the Board of Education originally prior to their going on strike. The union rejected it. But what's interesting is the amount of money they lost in six days is the same amount of money they got by the increase of the 6%. So and actually, they came out as a zero. <laughs> so what's the point of the strike? Because it was about more than wages, wasn't it? Oh, well, it was about power. It was about... No, it's also about that, as in this state, they are tired of taking out of their own pockets to pay for what's needed in the classroom. I mean, you tip your hand that it is not about individual liberty when people use their vacation day to go protest in Raleigh, and you want to shut that down. That was individual expressive well, action. I didn't know it what wasn't happened. compelled. And so, it, and again, there are, there are a multitude of reasons as to why individuals are joining associations like, uh, like NCEA here. Um, and I think it's important to address those issues, too. And I don't know whether this has been a part of the conversation in North Carolina. But, um, but again, Liberty Justice Center has no problem with the individuals who want to join because they truly support and they believe in the politics uh, of that association that's putting forward. But there are many others who don't. And so I, I've asked people, my mom is one of those. As I mentioned early on, she was a teacher for 30 years. Uh, she was a member of the affiliate association uh, in, in her home state where we live. And I asked her, well, why did you join the association? And she said one reason and one reason only. 
they told me that I, would, I, I could be sued by my students, and that if I were, that they would provide me with an insurance policy to cover that. And I wanted that. So I thought, yeah, of course I'll join. So these are some of the issues that people have that disagree with the politics, but who want that type of assurance. And so I know that a number of states have said, okay, well then the state government should address that issue head on. So we will pay for that insurance policy and we will hand that directly to uh, individual teachers. And so that way, if they don't agree with the politics, they won't have to join. Well, and one thing that a lot of people don't, don't realize that some boards of education do provide that kind of policy coverage anyway. So that if you do get sued by a student or a parent, the Board of Education pays for it up to a certain level. And then of course, only after that maximum level is reached, then does the union part of the policy kick in. And a lot of people don't, don't understand uh, that concept. You, you mentioned the uh, 22 uh, right to work states. Have any of them refused to take money from your paycheck and forward it on to a third party, which are unions. Can they legally, can we stop taking union contributions from a person's paycheck? In which type of state? And, I'm and, a little and, confused. For example, it seems the union say, oh, we want $20 from everybody who's a member of our union. North Carolina should say, no, you collect it on your own. There's an overhead for a state to take this money, put it in a bucket, and transfer it on, and find out that money is going to be working to undermine the right to work desires. It seems like we're helping them. And we got 22 states you mentioned are not right to work. Have anyone successfully said, we will refuse to take union dues from your paycheck? Yeah, I think states can and, uh, can and do uh, say that they're not going to take place in the payroll deduction system, that that's ultimately up to the unions to take, to take part in how they get their funds. The issue in the lawsuit that I mentioned here in North Carolina was the judge said, you cannot single out teachers. And you cannot say, we're only gonna stop dues deductions for teachers, but we'll continue to allow it for firemen, for policemen, that sort of thing. And there, the judge said, that's, that's not the right way to go about doing it. Fascinating discussion. Please join me in welcoming or thanking Brian Kelsey and Mark Janice. Gentlemen, thank you.